I'm John Carter in Moscow, in Havana, Cuba. Now in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. I'm John Carter in Petra, right here in communist China, reporting from India. Hi, I'm John Carter in the Solomon Islands. I'm John Carter in Soweto, from El Salvador. I'm John Carter in Sydney, Australia. John Carter tells us how to survive the end times. Glad to welcome you here today, our worldwide audience. Wonderful audience watching on television. We're glad that you joined us today. The topic today is a red hot topic. How to survive the end times. Most likely, the greatest scientist that has ever lived on this planet was Sir Isaac Newton. Now, many scientists say today that you can't be a, an intellectual giant and believe in God. Sir Isaac Newton said you could not do science unless you believed in God because if there is no God, there is no basis for the laws of the universe. I've got here today uh, an amazing book. It's not a book on science, but it's written by the greatest scientist the world has ever seen, yes, Sir Isaac Newton. And it's on the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation. Can you believe it? Now, this is not the, the original one, but this is a copy. It's written in the Old English. And uh, the original copy was found in the library of Thomas Jefferson. Because virtually all scientists once upon a time said that there was no uh, valid basis for doing science unless you had a great norm, unless you had a great law in the universe. How could you do science if, if everything happened by chance? This man, the greatest scientist in the history of the world, uh, wrote about the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, pretty much what I teach in these meetings. Today we're talking about how to survive the end times. And I'm going to start with two texts, Matthew 24, verses 14 and 15, and take a copy of the, of the Bible, Matthew 24 and verse 14 and 15, dear hearts and uh, gentle people. You got it? Hey, have you got it? Hey, I just want to make sure you folks haven't fallen off your seats and gone to sleep. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then the end will come. The Bible talks about a beginning and it talks about the end. Now look at verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Now, Jesus spoke about the abomination of desolation. He said it was spoken of by Daniel the prophet. The term the abomination of desolation is a biblical expression from the lips of Daniel that refers to the Antichrist. This prophecy has a double application. It was fulfilled in 70 AD when the Romans came against the Jewish temple, 70 AD. Then it was fulfilled, but it will be filled full in the last days with the coming uh, of uh, the great Antichrist who comes against the church. Now look at Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22 in this context. And remember, a text without a context is a pretext. You get that? Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. I want to read this to you. Verse 21 and 22. For then there'll be great tribulation. This is a famous topic. The great tribulation. Such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. 
but for the, what does it say? The elect's sake. That's God's people. Those days will be shortened. Now, not everybody will agree with me on this text. That's okay. We can love people even when they disagree with us. But listen to this. The Bible says in the context of the Antichrist who comes against the people of God, the Bible says there's going to be a tremendous tribulation. Most of my friends say that God's people have been raptured home to glory. And therefore the saints are spared the great tribulation. Please bear with me. Be tolerant with me. I don't believe that. I don't believe it because I believe uh, it is a theological fiction. Because the Bible says during this time when the great Antichrist does his work, when the abomination of desolation stands in the holy place and there's a tribulation such as has never been, it says if God did not shorten those days, nobody would survive, but for the sake of the elect, he's going to shorten those days. Now the elect are God's people. Why would you need to shorten those days for the sake of the elect if the elect had already been raptured home to glory? It doesn't make sense. I don't want you to believe it because I'm teaching it today. I want you to believe it because it's the truth and because it's taught in the Bible. The elect, who are the elect? Those people who have been uh, elected by Almighty God for salvation. You know what the definition of God's election is, don't you? The elect are the product of God's election. Somebody said, when God has an election, you can always be certain of two votes in God's election. God will always vote for you, number one. The devil will always vote for you, number two. And you've got the casting vote. So the elect are made up of those people who choose God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, for the sake of the elect, those days are going to be shortened. Therefore, I'm here to tell you today, the elect are not home in glory during the great tribulation. The elect are upon this earth. Who says so? Jesus. Now, in our study today, and that's what it is, it is a study of Scripture. In our study, we're going to divide this presentation up into three parts. Number one, the end times described. Number two, the end times prophesied. And number three, the end times survived by the elect. I was watching a, a tremendous program on, I think it was PBS, uh, The Men Who Made Built America. And it told the story, uh, it, it's just a fantastic series. The Johnstown Flood. I'd heard about it, but not in this detail. The wealthy people lived up on top of the hill behind the dam. And the poor working classes were down in the valley. And the people on the top actually weakened the dam uh, for their personal enjoyment. And then there came tremendous rain. May 31, 1889, the message went out. Morse code, the dam is becoming dangerous and may possibly go. Get the people out. But the man who received the message, tap, 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 said, 
We've heard that pretty story before. We've heard it over and over and over again that the dam is going to go. So nobody was told. And thousands of men, women, children and little babies were inundated. And so you may have heard over and over again that the end is coming and the great Antichrist is going to come and there's going to be this great time of tribulation and you're going to say like many of some of my friends, you'll say, oh, I've heard it all before. But remember the words of Christ and the flood came and took them all away. It's going to happen. And you may live to see the day. Okay, let's get back to how we broke up this presentation into three parts. The end times described. I'm going to give you stories from uh, the persecuted church. Stories that illustrate the great tribulation when the Antichrist comes. And these are not stories I got out of a book. These are people I personally knew. Like Paul the prisoner. Somebody said to me, "Uh, why isn't he smiling? Why isn't he laughing? Well, because he's got no teeth. They were kicked out by the communist guards. He was a Christian in Moscow. He's one of my best friends now. Betrayed by a pastor, placed in a refrigerator refrigerator cell for three years, freeze him, then take him up and warm him up, put him back in. His teeth lost by brutality. All you've got to do, he said, is tell us who helped you with the printing press. He said, yet, yet. These people I met over there who'd gone through hell were the finest people I'd ever met. Then there was a young Russian, Desmond Doss. I hope you've seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge. Um, I'm proud to have as my friends Gabe and Judy Vidella. Judy's here today. Gabe was one of the producers on... Hacksaw Ridge. Let me tell you about a young Russian, Desmond Doss. His name was, is, Mikhail. He was a non-combatant. Oh, you say crazy. No, no. A man with some conviction. Oh, about, um, no, no, no. A man with conviction. A non-conformist. He told me that in the dead of winter in Siberia, he was sent out in just a light uniform of the Russian army to load logs all night long because he was also a believer in the Sabbath. You say, I don't believe that. Well, that's fine, but he believed it, you see. Now, Mikhail was not raptured home to glory, but he was preserved in the midst of trouble. He was one of God's elect. God has so much faith in his people that he allows them to endure great tribulation. He said it was a privilege. When I went to Russia 30 years ago, I met Olga and Igor. Christians who were persecuted so much as all the Christians were by the atheists. In America, people say, well, look, you know, we've, we've discovered that atheism is such a great thing. It's so full of freedom and it's so sunny and it's so upbeat. Listen to me. Get informed. When the atheists were in charge of the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, when they were in charge of Russia and Ukraine during the 70 years of the reign of atheism, they murdered 
70 million people. You say, no, no. Hey, just get informed. I've been there 49 times. I've spoken to the survivors. This young couple, when they wanted to get baptized, could not be baptized in the daylight hours. They had to be baptized in the night at midnight. They went down to the river with their pastor and their friends and they took a saw and they sawed a hole in the ice. These are heroes, not wimps, not cowards, not flakes. Never went to church today, why not? Oh, I say that too. Come on, come on, what's wrong? People who talk like that are not the elect of God because the elect of God have got intestinal fortitude. Courageous in God, courageous in Christ. After they were baptized, their baptismal gowns froze solid on them, so they had to take knives and cut the baptismal robes off them. That was standard operating procedure. Some of us, if by the grace of God we ever get to heaven, are going to be embarrassed when we meet the elect. Vitelli's mother, Vitelli worked for me for 20 years, Mrs. Bactrim, the only believer in her village in the north of Russia, one of God's elect. The people in the village were communists or Russian Orthodox. She was persecuted, especially when her only cow got struck by lightning. Where where, where was God? Well, God was there. But God doesn't always take away the lightning. So they said, even if there is a God, he doesn't care about you. She received news about the death of her son who died in Afghanistan. Does this ring any bells here in America? They've been fighting in Afghanistan since Alexander the Great and nobody's won. The father, an old communist, was cursing. When they received the news, he he said, I hate, I hate, full of hate. The mother was praising God. You know how she got to church? She would leave home on Friday afternoon and start walking and in the winter wading through the snow. You're going to be embarrassed. I may be embarrassed too when we meet her in glory. She may say, what did you do for Jesus? Oh, a different breed. The saints of God. People say, no, no, all the saints of God. God's not going to let them go through the great tribulation. Maybe because they think they're weak like us. But the saints of God are made tough to endure peril and insult and persecution. So she'd walk all night, wading through the snow on occasions. Then on Saturday morning, she'd get out on the road and (laughs) hitchhike 100 miles. She'd get to the little church at 9 o'clock. They would be in worship until 6 o'clock that evening. Why? Because it wasn't boring. It wasn't boring. Oh, and they loved God and they loved each other. And then on Saturday night, walking home through the snow, through the cold, getting home on Sunday morning. Why? Back in the village, she was cursed, derided, mocked. She was one of God's elect. Don't forget it. During the 70 years of atheism, upwards of 70 million were starved, beaten to death in the gulags, the concentration camps. I've been to some of them. I've been there. No, you haven't? Yes, I have. But this time of trouble was a prelude to a greater worldwide time of trouble. And we who've had it so easy in this land uh, of prosperity are going to have an awakening. And we're going to discover 
what Christianity really is. But for the sake of the elect, Jesus said, those days will be shortened for the sake of the elect. If the elect were... Please stop. Think it through. What are you going to do with this text? Are you just going to say, oh, but my pastor... I don't care what your pastor says. He probably doesn't care what I say either. (laughs) Jesus said, but for the sake of the elect, those days are going to be shortened. Why would God shorten the great tribulation if the elect were home in glory? It's really absurd, isn't it? But God has got confidence in his people and he knows they're made of the right stuff. And for their sake, he will shorten those days. Now, a word of certainty and hope. There's a great message. And it's Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Turn in your Bible. Daniel chapter 12. Have you got it? Look at it in the Holy Scriptures. Daniel 12 and verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Jesus quoted this. Even to that time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who was found written in the book. God doesn't deliver his people by taking them away from trouble. That's a very popular religion. God delivers his people in the midst of trouble because God is God and the elect are the elect. And as the Anglican say, here endeth the first lesson. Now we come to the end times prophesied. Uh, Many believe we have reached the borders of the end times. I believe in the apocalypse. Uh, Scientists are saying that we've reached the end times because of climate change and global warming. The Amazon on fire, the Amazon Valley on fire. If one had taught this 50 years ago, the audience would have laughed. Don't believe this. I've been asked to recommend and preview a book by the world-famous scientist Dr. Hugh Ross on the great, great catastrophe facing the human race. Now, first and foremost, my authority is the Word of God but I believe in legitimate science. And when I see the Amazon burning, I'm not going to say things are the same. Secular scientists who don't believe in God say that we are facing the end of the world. And preachers today have gone soft on it. Amazing, isn't it? Sociologists and politicians, another group. They talk about the rise of totalitarianism, the collapse of civilization. They say, right around the world. 20 years ago, we were talking about a new era. An era which would usher in peace and prosperity. But everywhere we look today, There are dictators popping up. The rule of totalitarianism in the most unlikely places. That's what sociologists say. And theologians who sometimes get it right talk about the signs of the second coming. So we have scientists, sociologists, politicians and theologians all uniting with one voice and they're saying... We are living in the era of the apocalypse. And remember, Johnstown, we've heard it all before. 
We've heard it all before. And Jesus said the flood came and took them all away. Even TV programs I watch on occasions are on the end of the world. I don't watch them too much because they're so pessimistic because they've got it wrong. The History Channel, National Geographic. We're talking today about the end times. We're talking about the Great Tribulation. We're talking about the abomination of desolation. We're talking about the church going through the Great Tribulation. We've got lots more to share with you. So stay with us. And we'll be back in just a moment after this break. Hello friend, I'm John Carter. Behind me is the great city of Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Did you know, this is quite amazing. There are more people living in this area than in New York City, and Christ died for these people. We came here, oh, a long time ago, back in 1984. What's that, 34, 35 years ago? And we came here with a team of young people and we came to the PICC. It is our intent to come here, hire the biggest hall that's available, the greatest outdoor stadium, whatever it takes. You've got more than 20 million souls out here. And I say it again, these are people for whom Christ died. I'm asking you to pray for the people of the Philippines. Please pray for the people here in Metro Manila. And please write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. In Australia, write to me at Terrigal at the address that is now showing on the screen. We're back in Manila, and we're back with a message from God. That message is, Christ died for you. And Christ is coming again soon. Please support us. Write to me today, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, and also write to me at Terrigal in Australia. Thank you for your support, and God bless you. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.